Well, good evening. It's good to be with you all. I um, found this in the pulpit as I just stepped up, so there must have been some little visitors up here. Um, but let's, let's now turn to much more serious things and let's with reverent and serious hearts, but joyful hearts, um, prepare ourselves to meet with our great God. Let's, let's prepare our hearts. Would you stand as we receive again God's call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and has gathered out of the lands from east and from west, from north and from south. Would you praise with me? O oh Lord God, we thank you that you have indeed called us to be your own, to dwell with you, to have fellowship with you. You have called us to your temple this very hour, the gathering of your people. And Lord, we pray that as we come, we would not simply look to go through a series of familiar motions. We would not simply seek to be with those whom we know and love, our friends and brothers and sisters, but we would seek to commune with you, and that we would seek to come together with these brothers and sisters to enjoy your presence. Help us to do so with a due sense of reverence and awe, and help us to know that you, the great God of the universe, are also our Heavenly Father, so while we tremble with all, we may also tremble in your safe arms. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, please take your psalters and turn with me to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Uh, we are singing together verses 1 to 7, and later in our service we'll complete the psalm. We're thinking about uh, forgiving others later on, and that comes from a sense of knowing forgiveness ourselves, forgiveness from our God. Here, the psalmist is delighting in that, so let's delight together with him.
would you pray with me? O oh Lord, our God, we delight that we can come with the freeness of those who have been forgiven. The weight of our sin we could not bear. We indeed only know the half of it, but what we do know we, we could never bear. And yet, Lord, knowing that it has been dealt with decisively by your Son, that with you there is forgiveness, gives us a freedom and a joy. O oh Lord, help us to know more and more of this joy. And help us to act and live in such a way that it's contagious, that people wonder why it is that we're so joyful. Lord, we pray that you would have mercy also on this land in which we live. Lord, there are so many ways in which she has turned from you, turned from your ways, so many ways in which evil, evil itself is called good and celebrated, and good is called evil and is mocked and laughed at and may soon carry with it some more serious consequences. Lord, we, we pray for your mercy. Truly, we do not deserve revival in this nation. Truly, we do not deserve your spirit to send reformation to your church. We have as a larger church in this country, not been faithful. But Lord, you delight to send your Spirit with times of refreshing at points of lowness, at points of darkness. You delight to do these things because it shows forth your glory all the more. So Lord, we pray for your glory, for your name's sake, that you would do these things again in our day. We pray, Lord God, that you would prepare us for these things by helping us to walk in love for you above all else, holiness from the heart, seeking to shape all of our lives by your word. And Lord, we pray for our government, and we pray that you would give much wisdom at a, at a difficult time to our leaders where the economy is not as favorable as it has been. There's many factions in, in governing parties. Uh, there's much disquiet. Oh Lord, we pray that you'd give a, a wisdom to our leaders to do that which is right that you would keep them from foolishness. You would keep them from promoting that which is sin, even perhaps despite themselves. We pray that you might convert many of them. We pray for our king. We ask that you would convert him soundly by the power of your spirit. And we pray also for his family. We think particularly of the children of the Prince and Princess of Wales who are attending a, a school where there is much evangelical influence. Lord, we pray that you might even use this as a way of bringing your gospel into our royal family. And we do pray uh, at a time where there's much heartache even within their own family that you would cause them to turn not to their own uh, strength or resolve, but uh, to see their need of turning to you. Lord, we also pray for the other gospel preaching churches in this city. We thank you for them. We thank you for uh, George Curry at Elswick 
parish. We thank you for David Lamar at Welbeck Road and Dan Peters at NRHC and many others. We think of Grace Church and other churches, Lord God, JPC, um, that preach your gospel faithfully. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen their hands, that you would use them to build up the sheep that you have given them, and that we might together be a force for your truth in this place. Lord, we, we pray also that you would equip each and every one of us for the week ahead. We pray that you would give us the grace that we need to face the challenges and trials that lie ahead of us, that we would do so in reliance upon you and looking to the help of your Spirit. And now, Lord God, we pray as your Son taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, please take your psalm books and turn with me back to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, and we will complete the psalm uh, singing verses 8 to 11. Well, please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. We're reading the end of the chapter and beginning in verse 21. This is the well-known parable of the unforgiving servant. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king 
he wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Would you take your hymnals and turn with me to Matthew, uh, sorry, to hymn number 605. Hymn number 605, which is a debtor to mercy alone. We have just seen the goodness and compassion of our God represented in this King. And surely we have also received that. We are debtors to his mercy alone. So let us sing of that compassion together.
Would you pray with me? Lord God, now as we turn to your word, would you help us? Would you, by your Spirit, open our hearts and minds to it? Would you help us go from here and practice it in our lives? We know that this is only possible supernaturally. And so we cry out for your help. Through Christ, amen. Amen. Well, please turn back in the book of Matthew to chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Over the coming weeks, I'm going to be just continuing in Matthew chapter 6 in the evenings. There's a lot of wonderful material uh, in the end of this chapter, and so I will will seek to gain from the Lord uh, what he has for us in these things. And uh, tonight, we'll be looking at verses 14 and 15, just following the Lord's prayer. So would you hear now God's word? Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, we have these verses which present us with a very difficult saying. Uh, we, we find here almost uh, an indication that we are forgiven based on uh, what we do um, if we just sort of look at this on a surface level. Um, And yet, we know from the rest of Scripture that can not be the case. And so, uh, tonight, uh, I want to look at that, and I also want uh, to uh, apply the promise that's in these verses and the warning that's in these verses to us. But before we do that, we're going to have to step back and lay some groundwork. We're we're not really able to understand these verses unless we uh, step back and look at some foundations uh, that we can then use to understand what's being said here. So, as we look at these verses, which really encourage us to forgive our brothers and sisters, I first want to look at what a point I'm calling evidence, then forgiveness, then promise, and then warning. So those are my four points this evening. Evidence, forgiveness, promise, and warning. All under this idea of being encouraged to be those who forgive our brothers and sisters. Well, first then, evidence. As I've said, on the surface, these verses seem like they're saying that God forgives or withholds forgiveness based on what we do to others, whether we forgive them or not. But that cannot be the case. We know that. Um, We read in Ephesians 1, 7, In Him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins 
according to the riches of his grace. That's the basis of our forgiveness of sins, right? And also in Ephesians, we read, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The key to understanding the two verses in front of us is to understand that our forgiveness of others is not the basis of God's forgiveness of us, but rather it is evidence that we are truly trusting in Christ for forgiveness or not. How we interact with others is evidence of whether we are trusting in Christ for forgiveness or not. And my basis for that is the passage that we read just a moment ago in Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Our confession says when there is a portion of Scripture that is particularly hard to understand that we are to go to other portions of Scripture. It says, to quote it, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. So that's what I want to do tonight. If you remember from Matthew 18, which we read earlier, it makes a similar statement. Jesus says there, so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. Speaking of of the king handing over the unforgiving servant. But it puts that statement in a fuller context. Remember, a king is settling accounts and a servant comes before him who can't pay. He owes an enormous amount. He orders him to be sold, his family, all his possessions so that payment can be made. But the servant begs for mercy and the king has compassion on the servant and gives that servant mercy. But the servant goes out, finds another servant who owes him money, and when that servant pleads for compassion, he shows no compassion. He throws him into prison until he should pay. Other servants see this. The first servant is called back before the king, and the king rebukes him and gives him to the torturers till he should pay everything because he says, I had compassion on you should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant. What this parable is getting at is that the unbelieving servant's heart wasn't right. His heart wasn't right. His heart had not been touched by the incomparable grace that he had been shown. And therefore, he could not forgive his brother from the heart. God's grace, his saving grace, is sovereign. It is irresistible, and it never fails to have an effect. And therefore, one can never truly know the grace of God and be like this unforgiving servant. Never truly know the grace of God and be untouched by the incomparable grace that God has shown. And so, if one acts like this unbelieving servant, then it's evidence that, that actually that person has never really known the grace of God savingly at all. 
Of course, on the flip side, if we have truly known this grace, then in some measure or other, we will show it in return. Our forgiveness of others flows from our forgiveness by God in Christ. And therefore, it is evidence that we are His. This is why in the immediate context of the two verses that we're looking at tonight, Jesus taught His disciples to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our plea here is based on our forgiveness of others, but it's really pleading this forgiveness of others as evidence that we've already been forgiven. It's saying, God, look at what is true about me. I'm able to forgive my brother. And and that's speaking of, of the grace that you have shown me. And therefore, follow through on what you have done. Forgive me even as you have already done in Christ. Apply unto me what Christ has done for me. Christ, I think in these two verses, is speaking in a rhetorical way to drive home a particular point, and we'll get into that more in a moment. But the idea for the moment is that the way we treat others, the the forgiveness or lack of forgiveness that we show, isn't the basis upon which God either gives or withholds forgiveness to us, but it is evidence of where we are with God whether we have known His grace or not. Then secondly, I want to consider with you the idea of forgiveness. It's the duty that these verses are calling us to. But what is it? Well, it's modeled on the grace of God on the forgiveness that God has shown us. Ephesians 4.32, forgive one another just as God in Christ forgave you. But what does that mean? How does God forgive us? Well, Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 38, 17. You have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. When God forgives us, in Christ, what He does is He removes our sins from us. Of course, that's because Christ has paid for them. But in in terms of the removal, what He's doing is He's he's disassociating our sins from us, so that when He looks at us, He doesn't see us in those sins any longer, at least judicially. And as we interact with others, we are to do the same thing. Part of forgiveness is is disassociating a particular sin that might have been done against you from that person. We all know what it's like to have been sinned against, and every time we see that person, we think about that sin. It's so inseparable from that person. We, We can't interact with that person apart from that. Well, When you forgive someone, you have to separate that person from the sin. You have to be able to consider them, interact with them, live with them without uh, constantly having that sin in mind. You're, You're removing that sin from them. And then the Bible also speaks of God remembering our sins no more. Isaiah 43 25, I, even I, 
am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins, and I will not remember your sins. Jeremiah 31, 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and their sins. I will remember no more. Well, how does that work? Because God is omniscient, right? He knows everything. It's not as if somehow God uh, forgets them in, in that they go into oblivion and, and he has no cognizance of them. What is meant by that is he doesn't bring them up against us. He doesn't keep bringing them up. Uh, he doesn't uh, bring them up to himself. He doesn't uh, bring them up to us. Uh, they're, they're done with. He's, he's not going to uh, hold them against us any longer. And the same is true for us. When we forgive someone, we not only need to dissociate the sin from them, but we need to commit to not remembering it against them, not bringing it up against them. And that begins, first of all, by not bringing it up to the person, but more difficult, it means not bringing it up to others as well. You know, it can be relatively easy, right, to not bring that sin up against the person themselves. It's a bit awkward to keep talking to them about it, and so it's, it's quite nice to, to not have to bring it up again to them, but it's much harder not to bring it up to other people, right, because the same uh, things that keep us back from bringing it up to the person themselves don't always keep us back from bringing it up to other people, um, but part of that not remembering is not bringing it up to other people. And even deeper, it's not bringing it up to ourselves even. And this is something that is hardest of all. We cannot remind the person who sinned against us fairly easily. With a little bit greater effort, we can not uh, bring the sin up to other people. But how easy is it to still bring it up, harbor it, uh, care for it, nourish it in our own minds, to, to not let go of it? Sometimes this forgiveness will require us going to the other person and, and speaking with them about this sin. Ideally, it should in, in many instances. Um, them confessing their fault and, and then us being able to grant forgiveness. But there are other times when we can just forgive without that. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Love covers all sins. And, and there's times where the sin is not going to irreparably damage your relationship. It's not um, causing uh, very serious harm to the other person or other things. And you can just cover that sin. You can just uh, not, you can just let it go. But you have to truly let it go or go to them. So forgiving is, is removing. It's remembering it uh, no more. It um, sometimes involves um, interaction with the person who's sinned against you. Sometimes it can be done just unilaterally. But it is a duty. Scripture teaches, and these verses imply, that we must forgive. It is not an option. Some people have questioned this because uh, they read Luke 
17 verse 3 that says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And they say, because it says here, um, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him, then it requires him to repent in order for you to forgive. But I think the focus of these verses is not on putting a condition on forgiveness. The focus is actually on the, the freeness and fullness of, of giving forgiveness. Uh, you notice what is being said here. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I re- repent, you shall forgive him. Uh, there's very little time for conditions or anything like that if someone is doing the same thing over and over and over again in the same day. The emphasis is not on laying conditions on your forgiveness, but actually on the freeness and the quickness in which we ought to give forgiveness. Of course, we need to distinguish between forgiveness and reconciliation. We can forgive someone truly from the heart. We can um, remove their sin from them. We can uh, remember it no more to the best of our ability. But yet, maybe because they haven't turned from that sin or, or because there's lack of opportunity or whatever reason, there's no reconciliation. And that is a a separate step, but it it shouldn't hold us back from forgiving as much as is in our power. This uh, forgiveness is a duty, and a duty even in the most difficult things. There, you know, there are sins that are relatively easy to forgive. You know, someone speaks to you in a rude way or something like that. But then there are sins that have affected you massively. Things that have led to traumatic circumstances in your life. And that's very difficult to forgive someone in relation to And yet, we're told here in light of the grace that God has shown us that it is our duty to forgive. Our duty to forgive may not always result in reconciliation, but it's our duty to forgive. So we see here that these verses are talking about evidence, not the basis of our forgiveness. We've understood a little bit about what forgiveness is, and now I want to come to the verses themselves. Verse 14 contains for us a wonderful promise. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. The word trespasses here um, is different than the one used in the model prayer, debt, but it's just another way of talking about sins from a different angle. And here the promise is that when we forgive those who've sinned against us, we can have greater assurance that we are forgiven by our Heavenly Father. Forgiveness can be really hard, can't it? Forgiveness can be costly, requiring us to to give up hurts that we have held on to for for many, many years, things that are are deep and, and painful 
within us? What would motivate us to be willing to give up these things? Well, think about this. Not only might it be difficult and painful to let go of those hurts, to disassociate them from the person who's wronged you and remember them no more, but you receive something precious in return from that. It's not only hurt that you will get, but you will get joy and peace and confidence. Why? Because as you forgive that person, your heavenly Father is saying, I have forgiven you. This is evidence. This, this painful, difficult, hard thing that you're doing, this is evidence. This is speaking powerfully that I've forgiven you. And in some ways, the more difficult, the more deep, the more painful the forgiveness that we extend to those who've wronged us, the more powerful the Lord speaks with deep and strong voice to us that yes, I have forgiven you. The more strong and firm the evidence is that we can have assurance of his work of grace in us, that the grace of God to us has permeated deep within us, that, that we know it, that we've been overcome by it, the reason why we would go through such a painful, difficult thing as to forgive someone, especially when they've wronged us in terrible ways, is because God's promise is that as we do that, He will assure us that He has forgiven us. But then, there's a warning here as well. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If we cannot forgive, this puts a question mark over whether we know the grace of God ourselves. We've got to be careful here. You know, people aren't able to be easily, neatly fit into boxes, and every one of us is a work in progress. But the principle is that if we resolutely refused to forgive others, then it puts a big question mark over whether we know the grace of God, whether we've been mastered by the grace of God to us. I don't know about you, but that's a scary thing. It probes our hearts. That we might think that we know the grace of God we might joyfully sing of it in glorious hymns like a debtor to mercy alone. We might know all the theological formulations about how God saves sinners. And yet, by our unwillingness to extend forgiveness to others, show that actually the grace of God hasn't really gone very deeply within us. It's a call to all of us to examine our hearts. I don't know all the ways that you might struggle to forgive others. I know my own heart. But it's a, it's a call to us to examine the things where we find it hard to forgive. 
and it's a motivation to us. Release your grasp on those hurts. Why? Because if you don't, it, it's saying you don't really understand the grace of God. This verse is saying to us, don't nurse grudges. Don't nurse bitterness. Don't keep these things that would make it difficult to forgive. It's saying to us, by implication, fix your mind on the grace of God. Fill yourself with it. so that you would be able to forgive those who have wronged you. These verses call us to forgive our brothers and sisters for the little petty things that we experience every day and even in very serious wrongs that are done against us. And it motivates us to that forgiveness by the assurance of God that when we forgive, we can be confident of his forgiveness to us. And it also motivates us by the possibility that because we're unwilling to forgive, we don't actually know as much of the grace of God as we think. Take these verses away with you this week and meditate upon them. Pray over them. And fix your mind on the surpassing grace of God that would remove rebellion, unnumbered acts of rebellion that you have done against him would remember them no more against you. Meditate on that, that you might be better able to forgive your brother and receive this assurance that your God has forgiven you. Let's pray. O Lord, Help us to be better acquainted with the magnitude of your grace. Forgive us where we have been too slow to forgive. Help us where it's so hard to forgive. Master us more fully by your grace unto us. Help us to see it as glorious and wonderful. We pray through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, please take your hymnals and turn with me to Hymn number 438. We are preparing to come to the Lord's table. And this hymn is in two parts. Uh, Part one is leading us to the table and part two is is helping us as we have enjoyed the feast as we're preparing to go out into the world. So would you sing with me? Hymn number 438, part one.
we come now to the Lord's table and it's fitting that we should celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, after considering the verses that we have because this sacrament is a gift that the Lord himself has given to us to remind us of the greatness of his grace that he took on flesh and that he suffered the wrath of God for us that our sins might be forgiven, that he might pour out upon us the grace and compassion like that king did to his servants. And so I would exhort you tonight as you eat the bread and as you drink the wine think about not just eating and drinking but meditate upon your sins being done away with meditate upon God pouring out his wrath upon his son that that wrath might not fall on you. Meditate upon his body being broken that yours may not be tormented eternally in hell or everlastingly in hell. Meditate upon his blood being spilt so that yours might not be. Meditate on these things that you might revel more in his grace unto you. I'm going to read from the institution of the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood, my blood, of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This sacrament is for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. And so it's our practice that those who partake are members here or members in good standing of another gospel preaching church. If that's you, then I wholeheartedly, in Christ's name, invite you to come. If it's not, please still use this time to meditate on what these things mean. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we praise you for your grace. You have not dealt with us as our sins deserve, but you have sent forth your Son that you might deal with him as our sins deserve, that we might not receive your wrath, but the forgiveness of our sins. Truly, we are blessed. Truly, it is the case. Blessed is the man who has received forgiveness for his sins. O oh Lord, as we eat this bread and drink this wine, 
May our hearts sing forth that truth that we are blessed because we know this forgiveness in your Son. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus said, take eat. This is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We will keep the bread until we can all partake of it together. Jesus said and says to you, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We will keep the cup until we can partake of it together. The elder cups are wine and the inner cups are juice.
This is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Even as the wine has a, a sweet taste to it which lingers in your mouth, may the sweetness of Christ's work on the cross for you that speaks of your forgiveness of sin linger with you. Linger with you tonight, this week, and until we celebrate this sacrament again. Let's take our hymnals and sing again from hymn number 438, part two. Hymn number 438, part two. Lift up your heads and receive the blessing of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.